I never thought of it as a program. And I think that, you know, I used to live in New York and I wrote, you know, I think, I think if you're a poet or a whatever kind of artist you are, you probably write, you probably write, you want to be able to write or, or compose or paint every, anywhere, you know. Um, but um, I remember one day talking to a bunch of friends crossing the campus in college and listening to what they were thinking of doing with their lives. And I thought, they don't care about where they're going to be living. And to me, it's terribly important where I am, the place. The place is enormously important. And I want to live in places. I don't want to live in situations all the time. And they're talking about situations. And I much, I mean, I, I know I have to make a living somehow. Um, but that's not really what I what I care about. I mean, I wanted, I didn't, I wouldn't have known how to say it. But I knew that one thing was, was terribly important was a place. So I don't know. I just uh, uh, I had a retired maiden aunt who left me eight hundred dollars, which was all she had when she died. And uh, my mother put it in bonds, and it was, I had twelve hundred dollars when I was in my early twenties, and. I had it when I found that farmhouse, that ruined farmhouse that had been not lived in for almost 50 years. And I, the lady who owned it sold it to me for 1200 sheep. I said, how much would you sell it for? After a long conversation, when she wouldn't sell it. And uh, her husband said, you better sell it because it's going to fall down. And uh, so after tears, she said, well, I'd sell it. And the price she named was $1,200. I translated it into francs. I put out my hand just like that. I'm, I'm very glad I did. But it was, it looks straight down 400 feet to the Dordogne, and then it's, it's a whole valley of the Dordogne. I came out here in the 60s to do a reading over at the university, and I fell in love with it, but it was kind of unreal to me. And then I came back again uh, a few years later, and I spent I spent longer, and I got to meet people, and and, and some teacher, and a teacher in particular that I really wanted to, to see more of. And uh, I was, I, my, my my marriage had broken up in France years before, and my former wife wanted to live in my house over there, so I I let her stay there, and I, uh, I didn't have anywhere to live except a little tiny apartment in New York, and I, I, I. I decided I just wanted to spend more time out here. And little by little, I mean, I got hooked, you know, quite fast, in fact. Across the river from New York, in a place called Union City, which is right up, used to be before that West Hoboken. It's just up the hill from the Palisades from Hoboken. And from my father's church, I could look down on, on the harbor and I was fascinated as a small child to, to kneel up at a window there and just spend hours watching, watching the traffic on the, on, the, on the river, the river traffic, which is quite different then. And there's a lot more of it. But very beautiful, I thought. And I still think, I mean, there's just wonderfully, wonderfully clear images of it still there. I mean, I can still see the, the, the uh, the ferry barges, you know, take, taking, I mean, not, not just the ferries, the, the passenger ferries, but these, these things that would take a whole train on, on, on a series of barges across the river and ships going up and down in the afternoon light. It was very, very beautiful. Everything's gone. I mean, the, the traffic is gone. The Hoboken Harbor has changed completely. Uh, my father's church is long since, many years ago, gone. And the house is still there, but unrecognizable. But uh, uh, I've been back and seen it. I had to listen to all of these morning services. And I was allowed to do drawings and things and then do what I wanted with a little pad and pencil. I, got, I was fascinated by two things. One of them was the language of the King James Version of the Bible, which was different from the language that we spoke, you know, the language of the Psalms. And, the, and uh, uh, there was a whole lot of the Bible that I got to know by heart without even thinking about it. 
and the language of the hymns, you know, the spacious firmament on high and all the blue ethereal sky. I didn't know what half the words meant. That was wonderful, you know. And I thought I'd like to, and it, it's funny way, the way it rhymed. And uh, so I wanted to write that. And my mother read, read to us, which is very important. She read children's, she read Stevenson's Child's Garden of Verses, and she read Tennyson, The Brook, and uh, uh, a lot of poems like that. And uh, that's wonderful when parents read not just stories, but poems to their children, because po the, the language of poetry is, is different from the language of prose. And uh, ch children pick up that language. And if they can pick it up very early, it's really very, very important. They're likely to always love it if they do. And I suspect they really naturally do. And uh, that we've got uh, a growing up system now, and an edu I mean, Pache Frank McCourt, uh, uh, an educational system that doesn't encourage it at all. And uh, any more than they encourage listening to Mozart. Um, and you know, this, one of the strange things is that I don't think that's natural. Um, I have a friend, you know the guy who wrote Equus and, and uh, Amadeus? Peter and, Schaffer. Peter Schaffer. Well, Peter's a friend, and he, Peter was, I heard Peter give a brilliant lecture on Shakespeare a few years ago, and we had, we had a long, wonderful conversation afterwards. And he, Peter's gay, and he went, he had a boyfriend who was a young officer uh, and who never read anything, you know, he wasn't interested in reading. And Peter one evening said, I'm going out and I'll be back quite late because I'm going to the theater. And, he, and his friend said, well, what are you going to go and see? He said, well, it's nothing that would interest you at all. He said, I'd take you, but I don't, I, I don't think you'd be interested. He said, what is it? He said, well, it's a play by Shakespeare. He'd never heard of Shakespeare. And uh, he said, it's a play called, it's a new production of Hamlet, and I want to see it. We said, I'd like to go and see, see it is. If it interests you that much, I'd like to go see what it is. So he got him a ticket, and they went along. And this guy who'd never been to a play, never read anything like it, gets through the first scene of Hamlet on the battlements with the ghost, and goes, gets into the banquet scene afterwards, and he, he turns and grabs Peter by the shoulder and says, does anyone know about this play? He said he thought it was the most exciting thing he'd ever seen, that first scene on the battlements. And uh, I've seen kids sit up in the, you know, that uh, Shakespeare in Love uh, movie, which I didn't like very much, but uh, the, the woman coming, Julia Paltrow coming on and doing, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow doing Juliet. And these kids put down their popcorn and sit up on the edge of their seats. They've never heard anything like this. It's not so strange. They hear it. Uh, it's too bad that it's neglected because it's, it's a whole dimension to their life that they're not getting. When we talk about the extinction of species, I think the, I think the, danger, the endangered species of the arts and of language and all these things are related. I don't think there's any, uh, any doubt about that. I mean, I believe that... <clears throat> The invention of language and the invention of, I mean, I think poetry goes back to the invention of language itself. And that that comes out of, I think one of the big differences between poetry and prose is that poetry is about, I mean, prose is about something. It's got a subject and the subject comes first and it, it's dealing with the subject. But poetry is something else and we don't know what it is comes first. And... Um, the hearing something and uh, prose is about something, but poetry is about what can't be said. Poetry is, why do people turn to poetry when all of a sudden uh, the Twin Towers get hit or when, they're, when they're, their marriage breaks up or when uh, they're, the person they love most in the world drops dead you know, in the same room? Because they can't say it. They can't say it at all, and they want something that, that addresses what can't be said. And that's, that's, I think that's a big difference between poetry and prose. And, and that the, all, the arts, all the arts, in a way, do, are doing that, you know, saying, they're talking about what dove sono, I mean, that, that, what's that? I mean, that's what, what 
she can't, she can't say it, can she? Where are they? Where are they? What's happened to those days? I must have read Robinson Crusoe four or five times, and uh, the Swiss Family Robinson and Treasure Island, all of Stevenson. Um, book book called Ship's Monkey about a monkey off on a ship off Borneo, uh, and books about American Indians. I, I really taught myself to read because there was a book about Indians with pictures, you know, a lot of pictures of Indians, and and it was a children's book. But it had a text at the bottom of each page, and I couldn't read the text. So <clears throat> I asked word by word what the words were until I could, until I could read the book you know, about, the Indi about the Indians because I wanted to live in a place like the place they lived in, you know, in the woods. Uh, so that was, that, taught, that was two things. I mean, learning to read... Uh, because of fascination with people who didn't read and write. That's, that's kind of, sort of interesting. And um, realizing that early, that I really wanted to live not in a city, but in the forest. Seriously, well, when I, by, when I, by the time I was in college, I did. I knew I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I, th I thought, well, I'll have to do something else to make a living. I don't know what that will be, but I didn't give it a thought, you know. And I'm, I'm very glad I didn't because um, I don't know that this is true for the people who are going to be uh, corporate executives and, 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 and uh, hedge, hedge, fund, hedge fund operators and things like that. But it's, uh, it's certainly... I think it's true for them, too, I mean, to some degree. The longer you can keep the, the options open, the longer you can keep the choices open, the better. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, when I was in graduate school, <clears throat> this guy needed a tutor for his nephew. Uh, he was, and, the, and the nephew was Peter Stuyvesant. And this was the Stuyvesant family. And so uh, I, I had one year up in this extraordinary place, one summer, uh, which was an old uh, deer park surrounded by 17 farms, which were all part of the original estate. And they went back, that went back to the 17th century and earlier, I mean, early, in the late 16th century, when the Dutch, before the English came, in New Jersey, way over on the Delaware River. Um, and then over to France. That's what took me to Europe. And then from there, I had two other tutoring jobs. And I couldn't have done that, you know, if I'd been following a career, and, you know, if I'd all got locked into it and wanting to take, do the academic track and everything. I'm not, nothing against teachers or teaching. It just it wasn't what I wanted to do at that point in my life. And, um, I think kids find themselves sometimes, and some of these smart kids, it worries me, you know, that they may make crucial decisions too early and get locked in to something that will be apparently very successful but may not be what they really want to be doing. And that's, that's dangerous because that's where a lot of breakdowns and midlife crises and things like that come from. A lot of them. I mean, I've psychiatrist friends who've told me that this is the main body of their clientele, you know, the people who come in. I went to a, a very strict and severe Methodist prep school where I got a scholarship uh, to, you know, wait on table and so forth, to pay my way through. And uh, uh, I really hated the place because it was so kind of puritanical and severe and it was boys and girls, but they, but they were kept separate and they weren't allowed to speak to each other, you know. So there they were getting nubile and very pretty and all that. And you, you got, you got uh, uh, 10 demerits for ever speaking to one and 20 demerits for doing it again. And, and you got 30 and you were out for good. And, and uh, this, this, I mean, I, I really don't, my father, I had to be a good boy at home. Now I'm supposed to be a good boy here and I really don't like being a good boy, you know. 
but there was one professor there whom I really loved, and he, he wasn't like that at all. And he, he was the language professor, and he taught Spanish and French and German, and he was a, he was a funny, funny, sweet, humane, highly cultivated man, Lawrence Sampson, Lawrence Sampson. And he died soon afterwards of heart failure, but uh, he, he started me uh, paying a lot of attention to, uh, to languages, in particular Spanish, and then I went on to do the same thing when I got to college and uh, uh, had a very interesting Spanish teacher in, uh, in college who was so homesick for Spain, and he was Spanish himself. I mean, not Mexican, but Spanish. And uh, he, he wanted some help translating Lorca. Uh, so my, the first modern poet I read was a Spanish poet, was Lorca. It was Romanjero Gitano, and it was, the, it was the first book, and we translated that together. It was my first attempt at translation, too. And, uh, and then I went on and met Ezra Pound in, in the, in the uh, crazy ward at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington. Yeah, he was in the crazy ward. They, they, he was there... They, he was legally insane. Uh, I didn't know anything about his politics, fortunately. The fascists in Italy and, and his anti-Semitism and dread, dreadful things. Uh, and it would have been very, it, it's always been very troubling once I did find out about it. But I, I loved some of his poems that I'd read. And his, his ear, every poet who's come after owes him something. That's part of the enigma about Pound. Whatever they think about his character and his, you know, that we, we owe him something from the way he heard English. And um, so I went to see him, and uh, he said uh, that I had to, you know, go on translating. He took me seriously as a poet. And he said, uh, you should write every day and you should do all these things. And he gave me a lot of advice. He loved giving advice. <laughs> He was no more mad than he'd ever been. He was, he was nuts, but I mean, not mad. Uh, he, uh, he had gone on the air for Mussolini, and he'd said, he'd had, he'd said really quite, quite stupid, but very, very ill-judged things, bad things, uh, pro-Mussolini, in the middle of the war. And, and the prosecution wanted to shoot him for a traitor, you know, right there in Italy. And there was a movement to prevent that. And he got a, and the, his, his defense lawyer was a Quaker. And the safest thing to do was to say he was insane. He was eccentric enough. Somebody asked T.S. Eliot, if, he said, is Ezra written, had they known each other? Forever, I don't know. How, I mean, Pound was so opinionated that you wondered how anybody could stand being around him very much, you know. But he was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. And somebody asked Eliot, he had a lot to do with the, fi the final text of the Wasteland, you know. Pound did. He was he was very 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 skillful and smart. And uh, asked Eliot, he said, "Is is Ezra really crazy?" And he said, "Well, you know, Ezra." <laughs> They were very important to me, both of them were. Thurman, uh, hands-on about poetry, and he was, he was ruthless and merciless, and he would, um, he would destroy everything I wrote, you know, uh, week by week, and, uh, and, you know, I learned a lot from him. Uh, Blackmore was, was one of the most brilliant literary intelligences I've ever, I've ever been close to. And hearing him doing what he did every every twice a week, he had a, a sort of volunteer seminar. I mean, and certain invited people could come, and and he would just sit at the uh, table and talk about uh, one chapter of Ulysses, for example, for three hours with no notes or anything at all. And I, I just, I, I never. And he was. He was marvelous as a teacher. I mean, he seemed, he seemed really not to be paying 
attention, and then you realize he got everything about you, you know, and he, he, he was thinking about the right thing for you, too. And he, he saved me from getting thrown out of college a number of times, because he, there was one time when, because I, I, I never did all the right things. I mean, I never, I never read the things I was supposed to. I'd always read lots of other things and come in and, oh, and some of the teachers got very impatient, especially in graduate school. And uh, one, one, there was a party, I heard about this afterwards, when, when Blackmer was there and uh, the dean of the graduate school was there. And he was one of the people who wanted to kick me out. And Blackmer said to him in the course of the evening, he said, did you, um, did you ever hear about, uh, in your knowledge of Eng English academic system, did you ever hear about Don, whatever his name was, some, some year or other, Don Seymour Smith or something like that? He said, no, I never, and the dean said, no, I never did. And he said, well, Blackmer said, well, you might not have because his only claim to historic recognition is that he's the guy that got Shelley thrown out of Oxford. Um, and uh, the, the dean got the point, and, and they, they sort of put up with things that I'm sort of amazed by that, that I got away with. I, I was, a, nowadays I don't think it would matter so much, but I, I would read, something would send me off at a tangent, and I would read a whole lot of stuff, but it wasn't what the assignment was about, you know. It was related to the assignment, but it was a whole different thing. I did it over and over again. But I was reading endlessly. I mean, I, I couldn't stop reading. But very often I'd bo not bother with the assignment. I'd get on to something else. You know? Robert was a great model of working. I mean, Robert, Robert was... People, people handle interruptions and distractions differently, I've noticed. And... Uh, Robert was very good at it. I mean, he 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 would be he he wrote every day, uh, long for hours and hours in the study, and you know if he had to come out and deal with a meal or with a crying baby or with somebody coming to the door, he would come and do it, and then he would go right back into to where he was working, and keep it going. And James Merrill, who's a uh, dear friend of mine, a wonderful poet of the same generation. Uh, Jimmy used to say, oh yes, the interruptions are all part of the whole process, you know. It's, it's all right. It, it didn't mind interruptions. I don't like interruptions. I mean, I, I, and I very often, if I get interrupted very often, I don't even, I'm not even paying any attention to them because I'm, I'm, I won't leave what I'm doing. But, uh, I, think, I think the people who deal with them better are wiser than I am, but uh, I can't change that. I mean, I or if I can, I'm scared of losing something, I guess. It began with a honeymoon and with, you know, a, a wonderful uh, friendship across the generations. He was 30-some years older than I was, and he'd had that whole life in World War I and, uh, uh, and written written I, Claudius, and written Goodbye to All That. And those, you know, he was, he was quite well known by then. And his poetry, of which I, there's still some of it that I like very much. And I learned a lot from, from it and from him. I think the most valuable book is The White Goddess, and it's very controversial. And Robert, Robert cooked the books sometimes, you know. He made up the mythology rather than, rather than being absolutely accurate, which is... Uh, which is why it's not altogether trustworthy, but it's a very daring book. It's, uh, it's called uh, Grammar of Poetic Myth, you know, the, the White Goddess. This, uh, and he, he saw the whole world, the whole value system uh, on the basis of a goddess, goddess figure, um, not, not a male god figure, but a, a female uh, figure of and she's the goddess of lust and fear. I mean, she's, she's, she's not altogether gentle and easygoing. You know? uh, I thought when I read the book before I went to Europe that uh, this was a great metaphor, like something in Joseph Campbell or something like that. But I realized to my amazement and some consternation, you know, after a while with Robert, that Robert took it all quite literally, you know. He's, he was turning into a kind of fundamentalist of his own of his own kind, and um, and he eventually got jealous and fought with 
every younger poet that he, that he, he I mean, this thing would happen and he would, he would have a sort of honeymoon with another with a great enthusiasm, they'd be great buddies and then something would go wrong and Robert, Robert said they're not true sons of the goddess and all this sort of stuff and, and uh, drum them out, you know. And, and, uh, and it was kind of difficult because when, when we had our falling out, there I was with, with the job there, you know. And, uh, uh, but I, I spent that year with him and I loved the place on the north shore of Mallorca. And I went back on my own uh, for another winter there and wrote the translation of the, of the poem of the Cid for, for the BBC to, to earn some money. And something I didn't realize was happening at the time, everything from that deer park and the farms of the Stuyvesants through really the whole, the whole thing with that farmhouse on the Dordogne and, and the, and the year in Portugal and all that, I was stumbling on places and ways of life and assumptions of permanence of something that was very ancient, that had been there for a very long time and was just on the verge of disappearing. And if you went back even Five years later, it was gone. It would have been gone, and it was gone, you know. I mean, I had a letter from uh, Graves' son, William, who was the boy I tutored, and he hated being tutored. We didn't get along very well at all. I mean, the other, the other kids I tutored, I got along with fine with. William didn't want to be tutored. He hated me, and he, he had terrible fantasies about what a dreadful person I was. I couldn't understand what it was, why, why it wasn't working with William, and just I finally sort of threw up my hands and let him do what he wanted to do, you know. But uh, we're, we're, we're in correspondence, and he said, you know, he said, you saw Robert, in spite of all of the problems with Robert, you saw him probably at his best. And, uh, you know, he, he began to get, I mean, Ava Gardner came and called on him and, um, the following year, and they started putting him on British television, and he started earning a lot more money. They would choose out of a number, a small number of manuscripts, uh, the Yale, the winner of that year's Yale Younger Poets series. That was, that was a very big deal for a while. I mean, now there are other, many other setups like that around the country, and it's a good thing because they're publishing more books of poems. I don't know who reads them, but um, Auden did, and I was, you know, I was very happy. I was then living in Portugal, and it was wonderful news. I mean. Uh, uh, and they got good reviews, and that was very nice. Auden had a sort of fixation on being gay, what he called the homin turn, and he didn't like his gay friends or himself associating too much with straight people for a while. It was a, I thought it was kind of silly. Um, but I was also, I had an awe of, him, of, of Auden, and he was a different generation, seemed much wider a gap even then, I mean, then than it even does now, but it was, I mean, a considerable gap, that generation. And uh, we had mutual friends, and, you know, I called him up a few times in New York uh, to ask him questions about things, and uh, he was always very friendly. Um, but then we had one unhappy exchange just not long before he died. I wrote a thing, um, yeah, there, th that's what it was. I was supposed to go and, and read at the University of Buffalo, and I didn't know until fairly close to the time of the reading that I was supposed, this was at the time of the Vietnam War, <clears throat> I was supposed to sign the loyalty oath to the not only to the Constitution of the United States, but if you please, to the Constitution of the State of New York. And I refused to sign the loyalty. And I mean, I, we went around and around and around all the different ways around it, but they, they involved 
putting down my name and then putting, putting writers under it that made it empty. And I said, I don't see why I should do that. I mean, I don't believe in doing this. I don't think this has anything to do with loyalty. I think it has to do with entrapment. And uh, I won't play the game. I just, I won't do it. And, and, and at that time, it was $1,000 for the reading. They said, we won't pay you. And I said, well, we'll see about that. And um, finally, I agreed to go because a friend, it was a nice, it was Robert Hass who had invited me, and he was very embarrassed by the situation. He hadn't known about it to begin with. And uh, I went and gave this talk about being loyal, what loyalty really meant, and why I wouldn't sign a loyalty oath, and about the Vietnam War. And then I, I said, you know, um, that, uh, and I, I published the talk afterwards in the New York Review of Books and um, passed the hat at the reading. I said, this is a free reading, and passed the hat, not for me, but, for, but I said for the war resistors who've gone to Canada, you know, the, when the War Resisters League, this, will, this money will go to them. So they raised several thousand dollars for the, for the war resistors, and the University of Buffalo was angry as could be, and Auden wrote and said that if he didn't know me, when he didn't know me very well, he would have thought that the whole thing was a publicity stunt. And I, I wrote with, I spent two days over the letter answering Auden with deep respect, saying, you know, we completely disagree. This was a public situation, which I didn't ask for. And I had a right to make a public statement at that time and to use it because I think we're involved in something that is so wrong and so really shameful, and we've told so many lies about it, that if one has a strong position, one should speak out about it. And uh, it's not. And uh, I saw him once afterwards, and uh, we just, we, it was at a public thing, and we just shook hands, and there was nothing to say. He, he didn't, he wouldn't back off anything. And, and I, you know, I had apologized in print for offending him, but I, there was what could be said. And I was very sorry about that. Because I really did admire him and had, had this dream about Auden the day, the day after he died. Uh, I, I arrived in Athens and, and I went to see uh, James Merrill. And, I, and uh, James knew Auden quite well. I mean, you know, they saw each other, saw a lot of each other. And I said, I had, I had a strange dream about Auden uh, last night. On the way here in the train, I fell asleep in the street. But Auden was lying in a, in a cot, in a kind of place like a barracks. And that he sat up in bed suddenly, and he said something very important. And I didn't hear what he said, and then I woke up. And Jimmy said he died last night. I do think it's important to go to have a ritual, and to, uh, I, I just I try to be uh, very bearish about the mornings and do nothing, um, not get involved in the telephone or the or mail or unless you know unless there's something that really is incredibly urgent, I won't deal with it until till after lunch, you know, and then do all that stuff later and have the morning to stare at paper and. and and uh, think about poems and things like that. I don't know how it works. I really don't. It comes from hearing things rather than from having ideas. I've got, I've got notes, you know, that I've made over the years, and they're very precious to me, and I sometimes ponder over the notes and, and see, see what I thought I was doing writing that down, you know, where it was going. And, but it's come, the, the, the notes are usually things that I seem to have overheard rather than, they're not ideas. There's a wonderful conversation that, you know, Zola, no, it wasn't Zola, it was Degas. Degas and Mallarmé, French poet Mallarmé, were good friends for a long time. And Degas had always wanted to be a poet. And he said to Mallarmé, I don't understand it. He said, year after year, I've written poems, and they're terrible. I know they're terrible. I know they aren't any good at all. And he said, I don't understand it because I have such good ideas. And Mallarmé said, ah, but poetry is not made with ideas. It's made with words, he said. You have to hear the words. I 
I don't think any of these things is separate. You know, I mean, we're, I mean, one of the troubles about these, these these are incredibly smart kids, and they're they're at a point where they're beginning to think that smart is the whole thing, and smart isn't the whole thing. And smart tends to one of the troubles with smart is that it makes divisions, it, it chops things up. You know, I mean, Mozart doesn't have anything to do with business. Um, I don't know, it depends on you. You're what it has. You're you're what Mozart and business have to do with each other. <laughs> And uh, somewhere, somewhere, you know, look, look, at, look at where the connection is. You know, what I mean, um, it's not just a sort of relief from uh, from stress or anything like that. It's it's uh, something feeding some other part of yourself that you need. Yeah, there's a there's a great essay years ago by Francis Ferguson on Hamlet, and he starts by saying it is now three hundred years that Hamlet is making fools of his critics. They, and he said, you know, he said because. Hamlet is a sort of supreme, one of the supreme things of, in Shakespeare, in a form that is both more primitive and more profound than philosophy. You know that, uh, which is what's happening in in that you know, all through that play. I mean, and and Shakespeare keeps changing the way it happens. It's like looking at the planet Earth. You know that the whole thing is changing all the time. Uh, Shakespeare is changing it all the time. It's a great genius. And there's no point that you can grab it, that you can grab hold of that thing and say, yeah, that's the whole thing. I mean, Polonius's boring speech to Laertes with all the good advice, it's very good advice. Laertes is bored to death, you know. Where, what's, uh, it's, a, it's very hard to pick up that one, you know. You think, yeah, you can see the boredom and you can see also the wisdom in it. Yeah. I don't know why. I mean, none of the other playwrights do. We don't have anything from Decker or or Marlowe or Ben Jonson. You know, Ben Jonson was was far more, far better educated than Shakespeare. And, uh, he he would have had. There must have been a correspondence, but nothing's been saved. And of course, his house burned down, and a lot of stuff was lost. But <clears throat> you have no doubt that Shakespeare was oh, no. Shakespeare. No, I have no <laughs> doubt about that at all. Furthermore, I think there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that Shakespeare wrote that we don't even ascribe to Shakespeare. I think that, you know, the, uh, the, the Mad Tom poem, that great long poem, wonderful poem, probably was Shakespeare. A lot of other people think so, too. Well, I think that it's something that you're born knowing, you know? If you're if you're interested in writing something, then you want to write something that's really yours. You know, that's, that you're saying something you're saying, and obviously you don't want to just do something that's an imitation of what somebody. Although you're learning all the time, I mean, you need to, everything that you know is of is value to you. I didn't mean to dismiss that, but if you rely on it and think that it's all about knowing. Uh, it's going to be very dull and boring, and it's, never, not going to, it's not going to speak for anybody or to anybody. <clears throat> it's, it's what comes out of... When you listen to Mozart, and you're talking about Mozart, when you, or when you listen to Shakespeare, you don't know what part of yourself is responding to it. You don't know what part of your, them it's coming from. But somewhere in between is this, is this poetry, is this music, is that girl pouring water from the pitch, pouring milk from the pitcher. That's the mystery. Where does it exist? It's not in us, and it's not there, and it's not, it's not in the experience of the other, but it's all about experience. It's all about attention. And yet, I can't touch the milk in the pitcher. I can't, I can't hold on to those notes of Mozart. Uh, they speaking? I, I don't know the mystery of, of, of any single one line of Shakespeare, what makes it unforgettable. Just, and the, the, more you, the more you hear it, the more you think, goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. The kids, and I'm, you know, to echo Frank, I think it's, uh, see, I think, I think that one thing that's getting lost, like, in, like endangered species, and I mean like endangered species, I really think it's all an extension, of the same thing. Uh, kids used to always, there were two things I could count on. Kids liked the arts to start with. And I don't mean they like Mozart. 
they like to sing and dance, and they like, and they they like to make up little, you know, plays on words and do all those things. They did. It was quite natural, <clears throat> and they always liked animals. Now I think that if you you hand them a computer, they'd much rather pay attention to that than either of those things. And I think that's disturbing. This is, after all, a completely human, however miraculous it is, it's, it's sort of terribly ingrown. It's going back, back into something that you've made, virtual reality, instead of reality. And uh, I don't know, I find it, I find that, I mean, I use a computer like everybody else. <clears throat> I'm not in love with it, and I'm happy when I don't use it. But uh, to be hooked on it to that degree, I think, and I and I watch I watch people. You know, they get up in the morning and they go to the computer, and they, they whatever they do, whatever else they've been doing, they go right back to the computer. And I think that's uh, fixation. It's an addiction. Yeah, and and people very close to me have got it, and I, I'm just troubled to see it. And I see kids being brought up that way. No contact with animals. No contact with growing and living things. Uh, very little social life, and and this thing substituting for all of them, and I find that very troubling. Um, and I, I I expect that sounds limited and old-fashioned or something of the kind. I think I think you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't have computers, but I I think that that fixation is a little troubling. I was talking to Linda. So Lisa Randall last night, we were sitting next to each other at dinner. What a wonderful woman. And we were talking about these, these, these dimensions, this dimension of gravity, which I'm fascinated by, everything that she has to say about it. And she was talking about space and time just in passing. And I, I want to continue the conversation because I, I, want their, I want to hear what she has to say about time. I think time is, time is, time is a fiction. It's a human fiction. Uh, there's a reality, but we don't know what the reality is. I mean, you know, the, uh, the watch and the time that, that we're going by is a fiction that we've agreed to. But we don't know that it's true, you know, and it's, what its relation is to time and the universe. And of course, time to us, throw away the watches and throw away the, the chronology of all kinds. But time is really experience. Time, time is just, I mean, when we're, when we're uh, in love and, and wanting to see the, the person we're in love with, time goes very, very slowly. And the moment we're with them, it goes like lightning, you know? The trouble about being happy is that everything goes so fast. And, uh, and being in jail, it must, it must creep along incredibly slowly. Uh, I don't know that this is true to the same degree for animals as it is for us. I mean, a great deal of that fiction must be a human fiction. I don't know why I think that, but I don't think my dog feels time the same way that we do. Sometimes when people write about it, they say, oh, that's ter terribly morose, or, uh, or uh, very, do very dark, and all that. They're, they're, I think they're, they're kidding themselves. I mean, death is part of every moment of our lives. I mean, it's always there with us. It doesn't mean that we have to be gloomy about it. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, but it's always there. I mean, uh, yesterday is gone, hasn't it? Um, what we have and what we're, what we're blessed with is this very moment with, with the whole of our past in it and the whole of the unknown future in it, and, but it's all here. And uh, it's going as fast, faster than we can talk about it. Well, the, both of those are true at the same time. Are you going to sit and be gloomy about it? Uh, pe some people are terrified of dying. Uh, I'm very lucky. My mother was never in the least frightened by the thought of death. It was there in front of her all the time because she was an orphan. She lost both parents by the time she was six. Her grandmother took care of her until her grandmother died when she was 12. Uh, then uh, her, her brother uh, quit his education to take jobs so that he could support both of them. And he died when he was in, before he was 30. 
And when she married, she lost her first child, and 15 minutes after it was born, nobody knows why. They, they think the hospital made some mistake. And, um, <clears throat> so she'd had her whole youth was one death right after another. She, de death had, you know, she, it's as though she'd always known about it. It was always right there. And she wasn't afraid of it at all. And I worried about my father on that subject. But his last words were, I'm not afraid. He died. I think that's a great gift from parents. I don't know, uh, you know, what would be very rash to say uh, how one feels about it. But I, I don't, I certainly don't think of it with constant, uh, you know, seizures of panic or anything of the kind. It seems to me the bus comes along, you get on, you know. For the anniversary of my death. Every year, without knowing it, I have passed the day when the last fires will wave to me and the silence will set out, tireless traveler, like the beam of a lightless star. Then I will no longer find myself in life as in a strange garment, surprised at the earth and the love of one woman and the shamelessness of men. As today writing after three days of rain, hearing the wren sing and the falling cease, and bowing not knowing to what. Just now. In the morning as the storm begins to blow away, the clear sky appears for a moment and it seems to me that there has been something simpler than I could ever believe, simpler than I have begun to find words for, not patient, not even waiting, no more hidden than the air itself that became part of me for a while with every breath that remained with me unnoticed, something that was here unnamed, unknown in the days and the nights, not separate from them, not separate from them, as they came and were gone. It must have been here, neither early nor late, then. By what name can I address it now, holding out my thanks? Good people. From the kindness of my parents, I suppose it was, that I held that, that belief about suffering imagining that if only it could come to the attention of any person with normal feelings, certainly anyone literate who might have gone to college, they would comprehend pain when it went on before them and would do something about it whenever they saw it happen, in the time of pain, the present. They would try to stop the bleeding, for example, with their own hands, but it escapes their attention or there may be reasons for it, the victims under the blankets, the meat counters, the maimed children, the animals, the animals, staring from the end of the world. Yesterday, my friend says, I was not a good son, you understand. I say, yes, I understand. He says, I did not go to see my parents very often, you know. And I say, yes, I know. Even when I was living in the same city, he says, maybe I would go there once a month or maybe even less. I say, oh, yes. He says, the last time I went to see my father, I say, the last time I saw my father, he says, the last time I saw my father, he was asking me about my life, how I was making out, and he went into the next room to get something to give me. Oh, I say, feeling again the cold of my father's hand the last time. 
He says, and my father turned in the doorway and saw me look at my wristwatch. And he said, you know, I would like you to stay and talk with me. Oh, yes, I say. But if you are busy, he said, I don't want you to feel that you have to just because I'm here. I say nothing. He says, my father said, maybe you have important work you are doing, or maybe you should be seeing somebody. I don't want to keep you. I look out the window. My friend is older than I am. He says, and I told my father it was so, and I got up and left him then, you know, though there was nowhere I had to go and nothing I had to do. Oh, I, I have to do it. And then I, it's central to my life. Rilke said to a young poet, if you can live without writing poetry, don't do it. Nobody needs it. Uh, and, uh, but I can't live without it. I've always wanted to do it. And it's, it, makes, it makes sense of things. <laughs> it's all about attention and, and, the, and, the, and the listening. Pay attention and listen. Listen to everything. Listen to absolutely everything. Listen to the sounds you don't want to hear. Listen to the ones you do want to hear. Listen to the people talking around you. Uh, there was a wonderful thing this morning about taking the bus. Every so often I was say, saying to Paul over the last, as we went through New York, I used to love riding on the subway because I, you know, I don't have to have something to read. I'm just sort of fascinated by everybody around me, you know, the, what they're saying and what they're doing. And, uh, uh, it's, it's paying attention, but it's listening, listening. And all of a sudden you hear something. It may be, it may be uh, a phrase that you've heard over and over again, but you suddenly, suddenly got electricity in it, you know. And that, those, are, those are the notes. You know, you take out, what, what is that little charge in there? Where does it want to go? And, uh, you may not even know what it's about. But it's all about, all, you know, all, if you if you tried to write something new all the time, or as I have all, all your life, it seems to change, but it's really, if you're telling the truth in the, in the essential place where you don't know, it really is all, it's all you that's coming out, and it's, uh, nobody else can write it. And that's, that's, that, that's what you want. That's what you want. That, that's what you want to make students see, you know, listen. Don't, l don't listen. Chuang Tzu is a great, great Taoist, uh, probably as much as almost 3,000 years ago. He said, when I say that someone is, has, is good at hearing, I do not mean that they are good at hearing anything else. I mean that they are good at hearing themselves. That's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what the attention is about, you know? And however smart you are, if you, if you get distracted from that, you're going to end up in an unhappy place, I think. Our knowledge, the whole of human knowledge. Look at the night sky. How big is our knowledge? I mean, it's, we're, we're tiny, you know, it's, we're, it's, it's dust. Uh, that's not, that's not, it's tiny. The, the, the unknown that surrounds it is, it's uh, where it all came from. It's the great mystery. We, we don't know where it came from. How come we're here? It's not how come, it's where, not, so it's every bit as interesting as where we're going. How come, how come we're here at all? Isn't that amazing, really? Out of the whole of the universe, out of the whole of what we think of as time, here we are. It's very nice to win prizes. I don't think you should spend your life uh, hungering and thirsting for them. <laughs> but if they come your way, that's fine. It's, I remember John Berryman, some, somebody said, you know, there was some question of him winning some big prize. And there was a journalist uh, interviewing him. And he said, well, if you win that prize, it'll be wonderful, won't it? And uh, John said, yeah. It'll be wonderful. He said, 
It won't be very wonderful, but it'll be wonderful. <laughs> I thought that's pretty good. Yeah. There's a line of the Psalms that says, if riches come, set not your heart upon them. It's, you know, you accept them and you, you say thank you wherever it is, and you, it's very nice. But don't, don't, make, don't pin your life on, on, on these expectations. I've always felt that, you know, if it comes by, that's nice. 